Charlotte Barca is a lecturer in British history and politics at the University of Nantes. She specializes in Northern Irish history and the impact of the past. Her PhD dissertation was entitled Bloody Sunday in the Savile Inquiry, Truth, Memory and Justice. As part of a research project supported by Alliance Europa, she's been looking at the role of EU funded projects in the peace process, in particular in the city of Derry, London Derry. Her work mostly focuses on discourses about the past and on representations of the Northern Irish conflict. Today, Charlotte's presentation focuses on narrative about the past, truth and identity in the fire starters and the ruptures. Thank you. Well, I'm very small. I don't know if you can see me from behind the desk. Uh, so first, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And I must say that as someone who does not specialize in literary analysis, it's a very it's a new exercise for me. So I tried to well, I read these two novels, which I really loved, and I tried to find echoes uh, between the novels and uh, the things I usually work on as have uh, has just been explained so the past narratives about the past memory and truth so i have decided to work on the fire starters and the raptures i think now everyone knows what they are about uh, especially the fire starters the raptures yes everyone is aware of <laughs> maybe not everyone has read the book but uh, i will move on because we don't have much time left so i will not explain the plot uh so sorry i did have a small introduction yeah <laughs> Uh, in both the Firestarters and the Raptures, there are many references to the commemorative practices of the Unionist and Loyalist community, in particular bonfires and the 12th. So the 12th, as we now all know, is to commemorate the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. Um, in both novels, the narrator and sometimes the characters themselves display a certain skepticism, often tinged with irony towards these practices. In particular, the apparent emphasis on remembering the past, it is shown as disconnected from any real knowledge of the past that is supposedly being remembered, uh, the, the truth about the past, in other words. For example, in the raptures, uh, Hannah and her grandfather have the following discussion about the 12th. Do you even know what the 12th is about? I'm sorry, I don't read as well <laughs> as Jan. Do you, know, do you even know what the 12th is about, Hannah? Hannah shakes her head. She's a bit hazy on the details. She thinks it's something to do with letting Catholics know they're wrong. At least you're honest. Half the Egypts out there have no idea what they're marching for. Some of them don't know why on earth they're marching, but their daddies are orange men and their daddies before them. They've been at it so long, they've forgotten what the point is. It sounds a bit daft, Granda. So that's from the raptures. And the same idea is found in the fire starters. This is from the fire starters. The 11th is for bonfires, the 12th for parades, piss ups, and commemorating pro Protestant victories of the past. King Billy, the Battle of the Boyne, all the truths and where learned half truths which keep the orange ordered. Remember 1690, they say, the year it all kicked off. And 300 years later, they remain hell bent on remembering, though the details have worn thin from passing from one generation to the next. Fabrice already quoted this passage. So in both cases, you have this idea that uh, the truth about the past is actually lost. In fact, they, they, they want to remember, but what do they really remember? So this is basically the difference between history and memory. History, the, the ambition of history is to find the truth about the past. This is what history is about. It's, it's supposed to be about finding the truth about the past. Memory is in fact much more connected with the present than it is with the past especially when you're dealing with collective memory, which is, of course, the case when you're talking about commemorations. So the function of collective memory <coughs> is to define the identity of a social group. And for that, it uses narratives. Sometimes they're called master narratives. Sometimes they're called meta narratives. Meta récit, it actually comes from the French, from the meta. So stories that tell the, the history of your community. These narratives themselves are highly selective. So they're based on a number of events. Uh, this is a quote by William James Booth. Uh, he wrote a brilliant book called Communities of Memory. And he says, memory is not linear, nor causally coherent, but is structured by constellations of morally or politically salient events. So 
a number of events are singled out. Some call them founding events, les événements fondateurs, that's Ricoeur, Paul Ricoeur. Figures of memory, there, there are different ways of naming them, but these events are selected. So I'm going to go very, very fast here, I'm sorry about that, but to really, really simplify, if I want to give a few examples of founding events from both communities, in the Unionist Lawyers community, you have 1688-1689, the Siege of Derry, of course, the Battle of the Boyne. You could also say the Battle of the Somme. The Somme is also remembered in many, many murals. It's a very, very significant event for the Unionist community as well. So these would be three of the probably main uh, founding events in Unionist history. On the Nationalist Republican side, you will have, for example, it's not an exhaustive list, there are of course more, but 1916, the Easter Rising. I would argue that Bloody Sunday 1972 is also a founding event. The hunger strikes in 1981, for example, you will see murals of Bobby Sands. So they remember the hunger strikers from the 1980s. So this is how it works. You, you have founding events on both sides. These events are commemorated, are remembered. They are seen as important for the messages they contain. That's really uh, the idea. For example, the siege of Derry, no surrender, this very famous uh, loyalist catchphrase, it comes from the siege. And it tells the story of a community who resisted against all odds and will not surrender. It also is connected to a whole mythology about traitors, for example, and loyalty. So these founding events tell a story about the community. So commemoration is really about this. It is about defining the identity of a community what it is and what it is not. That's crucial. Um, the, the, the quote that I gave earlier, the truth and half truth that keep the orange ordered. This is really a great quote. It really explains it. It's, it's about ordering the community, about defining the community. Uh, for example, there, there's this quote here that explains how it works from uh, Asman and Exaplica. The objective manifestations of cultural memory are defined through a kind of ident uh, identificatory determination in a positive, we are this, or in a negative, that's our opposite sense. The supply of knowledge in the cultural memory is characterized by sharp distinctions made between those who belong and those who do not, i.e. between a person to oneself and what is foreign. So it's about differentiating us from them. And Hannah's situation in the raptures really illustrates the importance of these founding events in the, perceptions, uh, in the perception sorry, of one's identity because her parents, even though they're Protestants, are not interested in the orange traditions. So they're both insiders and outsiders. And therefore, Hannah knows what she's not. She knows, she knows she's not a Catholic, basically, but she's not even too sure she's a Protestant, in fact. Uh, there is this whole passage about her classmates who are in bands. Uh, she hears them sing the sash. Even they don't really know the song, by the way. They're, they're mumbling the bit they can't remember. So. It's not just her, but she's very confused about this. Uh, they sing, we are, we are, we are the Billy Boys. They sing about following Rangers of the Falls and round Derry's walls. Hannah doesn't have a clue what they're talking about. And she talks to a classmate uh, who's also a bit clueless because his family is also a bit uh, marginal. Is your dad an orange man, he asks. No, says Hannah. Is he in a band? No. Are you even Protestants? I think so. She isn't exactly sure what they are, so. Here you see uh, the confusion. She cannot relate to these practices, the 12, the bands, the singing, and she cannot reconcile her own experience with the approved narrative of what it is to be a Protestant. So she isn't even sure if she can really call herself a Protestant. In the Firestarters, the wave of anger that goes to the city is a response to a perceived attack on the community's symbols uh, through their commemorative practices, in this case, bonfires. And symbols are described as a way to cling to your difference and therefore the basis of your identity. First the peace walls, and then the roads, the flags, and now our bonfires, they say. Soon we won't have anything left. They are at heart terrified that once the last symbol has been stolen from them, they will not know themselves different from the stranger in the street. So this is really the function of memory, commemorative practices, symbols, as a way to define what you are as opposed to the others. 
Thus, from the point of view of the community itself, identity is not based in any attempt to preserve the truth about the past. It's rather a means to maintain the barriers between us and them. Now, I want to move on to another idea. So I also worked a bit on regeneration through uh, studying EU-funded projects in, in Derry. Um, so there is also this issue of identity as the image you project to others, outsiders. And in particular, in the fire starters, especially, there, there are lots of passages that allude to tourism and the problems raised by regeneration policies in the city like Belfast. So I don't know Belfast as well as I know Derry. I'm sorry about that. But I would try to still find echoes between um, regeneration, tourism, and this idea of a, a loss of meaning or authenticity. So the development of, uh, the, of tourism after the peace process has been key to policies of regeneration in Northern Ireland, and they're often linked with policies of reconciliation. There's this idea that they go together, that if the economy could improve, then reconciliation would follow. But of course, uh, some of this tourism is also linked to the conflict. So there are several types of tourism. The first type is so-called dark tourism, which involves the famous black taxi tours, for example, uh, taking tourists to see the murals in particular. This type of tourism is portrayed negatively in the fire starters with an emphasis on the lack of authenticity. Um, this quote here, we put the visitors in black beetle taxis and drive them around, around the ring road, up the tiny streets, and down until they too are dizzy seeing this city from so many angles. And at the end, we dance for them and their foreign money. We are also prepared to cry if expected. So here the locals are basically selling foreign tourists what they want, which is a performance of trauma in a way. It is not authentic. They're, they're prepared to cry because they are supposed to be miserable and in, in a conflict or post-conflict society. Uh, this is called what well, Breeti Hawking in her book about regeneration talks a lot about tourism as well. And she talks about the tourist gaze, the problem of tourist gaze and this objectification of locals which is sometimes self-inflicted because they find profit in it, of course, as well. So sometimes it is a self-inflicted objectification in a way. And she explains also that this kind of tourism is being reframed or repackaged, if you want, by public policies as a form of peace tourism. Uh, and she um, quotes this example of tourists writing messages on the peace walls. And she says, ironically, very often it is for the consumption of other tourists. It's not the locals that are going to look at the peace messages. It is other tourists. So it's just, it just feeds itself in a way. But there's very little truth in that and very little authenticity. Uh, the tourist board in itself, I just picked this one quote, but there were many, uh, is depicted as clearly creating lies about the city, basically. Even the tourist board, whose job it is to spin the city sideways, are calling this summer a wash washout. So the idea is they're producing a fake image of the city. And apart from dark tourism, of course, there is another type of tourism. And it is the one that is connected to regeneration. And it's probably best exemplified by the Titanic quarter. Um, Dominique already mentioned before that uh, the, the boat itself is mentioned but not named in the novel. Uh, the, the sunken boat which holds the whole city captive from the ocean floor. So there's this idea that it's a bit of a prison. And really, uh, the Titanic, Titanic quarter, so the, the whole area around uh, this new uh, attraction called Titanic Belfast, uh, has often been criticized. It was really at the heart of the whole regeneration uh, process in Belfast. It has been criticized by many academics for having very little truth in it. I've got a quote here, yes. Uh, William James Neal, uh, Belfast sees an appropriation of its shield building heritage appropriately scrubbed and sanitized in the discourse clothes of the urban Renaissance. This is very typical of uh, academic uh, writing about Titanic Belfast. It's seen as a theme park more than a museum. It does not really have any artifacts. Uh, it is more of an experience. Uh, it does have educational, uh, some, a section that, that is more educational, but it, it does look a bit more like a theme park than a museum, to be honest. So it's often seen as the most obvious example of the commodification of heritage and of a tendency to create a new post-conflict identity for the city that is wrapped in consumption. This is the expression used by Neil Murray and Grist. 
An invitation was extended to common civic pride with the possibility of the pooling of difference in a shared identity wrapped in consumption. So reconciliation goes through everyone becoming a consumer. There was the idea also of the foreign money in the quote from the novel. So, you know, in a way, consumption is the solution to everything. Uh, another idea that resonated with the novel, I think, is this idea of civic pride. It was in the previous quote I've just uh, read. This idea of Belfast trying to be a true European capital, uh, it's often referred to in the Firestarters in an ironic way. Uh, this city continues to talk. It tells anyone inclined to listen that it is a European city, twinned with other European cities. Who is this city kidding? Lots and lots of quotes. I selected only a few. Um, all those things. There's this, this idea in the book that Belfast is hardly a proper city. It's a, it is functional in limited measure. So it is a functional city, but barely. Uh, also this quote, um, the fact that tourists might even think of going there is portrayed as an anomaly. We wish to say to them, the tourists, are you mad? Why have you come here? Don't you know there are proper other proper cities just one hour away? By budget airline, there is even Dublin. <laughs> we are not supposed to say this. We have already begun to lean on their money. So again, the idea of money here, uh, people kind of selling their soul for, for the money of tourists. Uh, this really resonated with me because uh, as someone who goes to Derry quite often, I hear that all the time. People in Derry do not understand why I go there. And I heard this kind of discourse time and time again. People who told me, you're spending nine days in Derry. What are you going to do in Derry? Well, I love this city. There's plenty to do. And also, obviously, I'm an academic, but I wouldn't advise necessarily for tourists to spend nine days in Derry. But three or four days, I think, can be perfectly... Uh, you know, a perfectly good idea, but th there is this, what they call in regeneration policies, they call that a lack of civic pride. The idea that your place is not interesting, that people have to be mad to come to this city because there's nothing interesting there. So this irony about Belfast um, and its claim to the status of a true European capital, it also reminded me of Many quotes I found in uh, The Great Reimagining in the, the book by Bree T. Hawking about regeneration policies. She quotes so many officials, and you see a lot of this kind of discourse, in fact. Uh, for example, I just chose one example. This is the unveiling oh, sorry, of the rise sculpture, which was one of the, the iconic sculptures uh, that was supposed to uh, represent new Belfast. It was described as a talisman of monumental scale that shouts loudly from the rooftops that Northern Ireland has a big vision and big ambitions. It will tell tourists and investors that Belfast has become a truly international cosmopolitan city with all the associated artistic trappings, and that's really important. So you find lots and lots and lots of actual quotes like this, and it really resonated with the novel because it's exactly the same, time of, the same type of talk that is being uh, mocked in the novel. Uh, I also found a lot of connections between rise and what is humor humorously denounced in the fire starters. For example, abstract pub public art like this is often said to be iconic and it is meant to be neutral. That's the point. Um, it's not supposed to be associated with any of the two communities, with either of the two communities, because otherwise it's bad. It brings uh, controversy. So the idea is it has to be neutral. And the problem is in e it's empty as well. That's why it's neutral. And uh, this really reminded me of the quote, of course, this is Belfast, this is not Belfast, especially spirit of Belfast. So this culture is supposed to represent Belfast, but actually does not really represent much. It is iconic. It's iconic means it stands for Belfast. So that's the idea of iconic. But in practice, you know, these cultures, what do they really represent to most people? They represent everything and nothing. That's why they're neutral. And that's why you can project any narrative onto them. Um, they're so-called empty signifiers. And in a way, placeless and maybe meaningless, you can ask the question. You can project any narrative onto them. And even their shape is deliberately conceived, especially the rise. It's a sphere. And you could say the same about, about the peace bridge in Derry, even though I would say that this one is probably a bit more successful in connecting with the locals. But it was deliberately designed to look the same from every perspective. And again, that reminded me of a quote from the book, which is, 
in this city, truth is a circle from one side and a square from the other. It is possible to go blind staring the shape of it. Even now, 16 years after the troubles, it is much safer to stand back and say with conviction, it all looks the same to me. So this fear is exactly that. It's the idea that since truth is a square from one side and a circle from the other, we're going to create something that looks exactly the same from every angle. And so people can pretend that it's all the same to them. I think there's really, it might be worth thinking about that when you wrote it. But it, for me, there's really something here that resonates. And I can see I'm probably running out of time soon, so I will go a bit faster on the rest. But I wanted to um, finish with language, because in my opinion, this is also connected to the idea that language is either con contested or empty. Uh, there's a lot in both novels about the talking and also names. So names are problematic. They're trying too hard to pass for truth. If you know anything about the history of Northern Ireland, you would find lots of examples of names that are problematic. There's, of course, Derry, Londonderry, the very famous name dispute. But also the North of Ireland, Northern Ireland. People, some people prefer to say the North of Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, depending on if you're a Catholic or Protestant, there's a preferred way of saying it. So language is problematic in itself. And I wanted to give you this example, even though it's dairy, but the, how do you circumvent this problem? We have a problem. We have a contentious name. We'll just create a, a new name. We rebrand the city, and now it's legendary. And that's really the, the catch. That was a catchphrase for the UK City of Culture Festival. So it's another example of how regeneration tends to substitute empty uh, marketing concepts to problematic words. Uh, there's a lot also about empty talk in the Firestarters. The politicians say nothing. They are particularly gifted in this arena. I can often talk for hours at a time without saying anything at all. So that's the solution. When you can't talk because talk, talking the words are contested, you just say nothing. Hannah in The Raptures is also very confused about talking. She says, she understands, she hears that from adults. Them lots need to wise up and start talking to each other. I'm not sure who stopped talking to who. Ian Paisley's never done talking, and Jerry Adams talked so much, they've got somebody else to do his voice. I suspect it's the one in the balaclavas who need to, to talk, maybe to each other or to the police. So she understands that talking is important, but she's not too sure exactly why. And I'm just thinking about this now, but of course there's also Jonathan, who's terrified of his daughter talking. So. The status of words is problematic. So I will conclude now, because I'm sure it's time to conclude. Um, so The Fire Starters and Raptures are two very different novels, but both contain similar reflections on the elusiveness of truth and of the paradox of having an identity that is seemingly strongly tied to history, but seems to have lost, sorry, lost its connection to any tangible truths about the past or knowledge about the past. In such a context, language can either become contested, like it becomes a battlefield almost, or it can become empty. That's the, the solution to the problem. Words tend to lose their meaning, and whether it's the words of the politicians or the journalists, I, I wanted to talk about the journalists, but obviously I did not have time to add a whole part about the journalists, but they do take a lot of criticism as well in the books. All the sections of society that are trying to promote a certain image of the place, like the tourist board, for example. If I was to make one last link to the political background, I would say this is reminiscent of the so-called constructive ambiguity on which the whole Good Friday Agreement uh, was built. You know, it's a document that was drafted deliberately to mean several things to different people. So I don't know if that makes much sense, but that was my conclusion. <laughs> you know, that you, to find an agreement, you know, you, you find something that can mean different things to different people. So you can find an agreement between people who agree about nothing, except that peace is better than no peace. Thank you.